Good morning, Klondike Church family. Welcome today to our time of prayer and Bible study here online. I'm so glad that you're connecting with me this way. I wish that we were in person together in the building. That was our plan. But as we gather this morning online, it's a reminder that God is in control. He's sovereign. And we made plans to meet together this week. And the Lord had other plans. And we have to bow to him and worship him and trust him that he knows what is best. So I thank the Lord for his guidance and his leading. So at least we can meet online together one more time and seek the Lord's help as a church family. This has been a hard week, but I'm trusting that a good God will be faithful in the greatest hardships we face. And as we face the new week ahead on this, the Lord's day, the day we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus from the grave, my prayer is that this will be an encouragement to each one of our hearts. So I welcome you this morning, and I'm so glad that you're watching right now, and hopefully either sitting there looking at your smart device or you're uh, looking at the TV and you're watching the service with me. I'd like to share my screen for just a minute with you. Today is Sunday, August 22nd, and our church exists to be a church that's passionate about proclaiming and living the gospel. Good news by loving God and our community for his kingdom and glory. And so that's what we seek to do. And this morning, I pray that our hearts would be stirred to do those things as we love God and we pray and we read his word together today. So our call to worship as we begin our time comes from thought Psalm chapter 37. This is a section about salvation, about strength and help. Oh, that God would provide these things for Klondike Church and for Scambia County, which is really desperately in need of his love and his grace and help. The psalmist says the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them. Why? Because they trust in him. When we feel like we're lost, we need to trust in him for salvation. When we are weak, we need to look to Jesus Christ for strength in the time of trouble. Friends, when we feel like there is no hope of being rescued or delivered, we need to look to Jesus Christ, no matter how many things are coming against us, whether the wicked, whether they're individuals, or the evil and brokenness that we face every single day, trust in him. Salvation is from the Lord. It's not from the church. It's not even from other brothers and sisters. The salvation comes from Christ Jesus. So join me in prayer. And let's ask God to give us exactly this kind of strength and deliverance promised in this passage. Oh, Lord God, we come now praying that you would help us to worship you. Lord God, even though we are not together in body, I pray that our spirits would be willing and that we would be together by you, Holy Spirit of God. Unite our hearts and may you speak truth to us and may you encourage us and strengthen us this day, we ask in Jesus' holy and faithful name. Amen and amen. Well, as we do every Sunday, the next part of our time together, I would like us to confess our sins. Before we hear the word of God taught and we focus on it, I think it would be good for us to prepare our hearts, to ask God to, to not only work, um, to stir our hearts for the new week, but to cleanse that which has held us away from him in the past. So if you would, please join me and let's together confess our sins to the Lord in the words of Psalm 51. Lord, hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. And now I pray you would hear the word of God, a word of assurance to all those who humbly call on him. The prophet Isaiah says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, but the Lord has laid on Jesus the sin, the iniquity of us all. Thanks be to God. 
Well, we are going to begin a time of Bible study, but I want to encourage you that after the Bible study to stay around because we are going to have some prayer together. We need to pray this morning. There are so many people in need of the Lord Jesus' help. And so we'll talk about why we're even doing this service on Zoom right now um, at the end of our time of Bible study, and uh, we'll pray together. But now let's set our hearts on God's Word. I know you've been watching the news a little bit, at least this week, whether it's been online or on a television, and you have seen how catastrophic the scenes are that have been flashing in front of our eyes in the country of Afghanistan. Now, we're not going to talk about politics today, don't worry. But I do want to talk about what the Bible teaches about our Lord Jesus Christ. And I want us to help understand what scripture teaches about Jesus in comparison to what Islam teaches about Jesus. Listen, I want you to have a compassionate heart, but also a very ready heart, knowing that the gospel and the hope of Jesus is the only thing that is going to help in a world that looks like it's tearing apart in many ways, where many are losing confidence in world leaders, where many of us are even fearful of what the future holds. The reality is we need to have an answer as Christians. So I pray today this message would be helpful to each and every one of us. So if you would, grab a Bible and turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 8 this morning. I want to talk about, again, Islam and the Lord Jesus Christ. So 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and I want you to turn there and follow along with me as we consider this important theme. Paul the Apostle says these words in the 8th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in this world, and that there is no other God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. So today I want to talk about Islam and the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to begin by describing the city of Corinth that Paul is speaking about here in 1 Corinthians 8. Corinth was a very important city in the first century. It was a wealthy port city. It had a population of about 80,000. So if you think Escambia County has about 300,000, Pensacola 50,000, this is an ancient city with over 80,000 people. And if you include the towns and villages on the outskirts, you're talking 100,000 people. Now, this was a city that was dominated by paganism. Paul's writing to a city dominated by many different gods that are being followed and worshipped. In fact, here is uh, some maps and some pictures. You get an idea of where Corinth is located in the world. And it's amazing that even today, you still see the ruins of some of the pagan shrines and temples. In fact, the great temple of Aphrodite had over 1,000 prostitutes that were involved in leadership and worship in this pagan city. The city had a theater that could hold 20,000 people and athletic games second only to the Olympics. So this was a very important city, but it was also a city that was polytheistic. There were many different worshiping practices and many different religious ideologies that you would find there. Now, because of their belief system, this led to behavioral uh, differences from the Christian world. The word Corinthiazomai in Greek, which means to act the Corinthian, came to be a term that meant simply to be someone who is loose in their human sexuality, someone that practiced fornication. So if someone was Corinthiazomai, they were someone who was very immoral. And that was just kind of a, a just common term that was used to describe people 
from Corinth. The New Testament scholar N.T. Wright says the worldview of the entire town was dominated by pagan assumptions. The visual appearance of the town was dominated by pagan symbolism. The normal mindset of the average Corinthian was dominated by pagan ideas and hopes and pagan motivations. And the normal lifestyle was dominated by pagan practices. We get the point, right? As Paul is writing these words, he is right, he is trying to help these new Christians, Christians like you and me, work through how does a Christian live in a pagan city? How does a Christian live in a city that is dominated by many different religious ideologies? He's writing in particular about behavior issues that Christians need to understand. We are different as Christians from those who worship in other ways and other religions. So he's answering in 1 Corinthians issues of ethics and morality, marriage, singleness, what we eat, what we drink. The idea here is that Christianity impacts all of our behavior. And so when you see the ruins of the temple of Aphrodite in Corinth, you recognize these new Christians in Corinth had to, to learn how to be faithful to Christ in a world that was not faithful to him. What is our relationship to other religions? And when we're talking about Islam, of course, today, and we see the Taliban in Afghanistan taking over, and we know there's groups like ISIS out there that are still very prevalent, and um, even Al-Qaeda still exists, but then there's just it, Muslims, uh, many Muslims in the world. What is our relationship to them? What do they believe about Jesus, and how should we relate to them? So Paul begins in 1 Corinthians 8, and he says, concerning things or food offered to idols, I'm writing to you. So in the first century, it was very common for a person to go to a temple. They would bring a animal to sacrifice. The, the priest would sacrifice the idol. Typically, um, the priest would eat part of the, idol, part of the sacrifice. Part of the meat would be burnt up as a sacrifice. And then what was left over would often be sold in the first century. Temples in the first century were often uh, places that were kind of like restaurants where people would go and eat together. And the meat that was served there was generally a lot cheaper because it was kind of a seconds meat, if you will, that had been offered. And people, of course, just like today, love a bargain. So temples were not only religious places, but they were places of social gathering for food and eating and even like as a restaurant. And so in chapter eight, uh, verse 10, Paul talks later about the issue of um, eating to, eating in a pagan temple. Should a Christian do that? Now, when we talk about idols and this idea of other gods, it's important to say that an idol is something that represents a transcendent being. And Corinth was a place where idolatry was mingled in, in the common life everywhere you would go. And so um, when you look at Corinth, you see a place where the deity Aphrodite, the goddess of love and beauty and pleasure and procreation was worshipped. You see a place where Poseidon, the god of the sea, of the pantheon of the Greeks, was worshipped. And this temple here in front of you had over a thousand priests who were like religious prostitutes. Also, Caesar was worshipped as a god there. Now we see this and we feel really far removed. But I'm going to try to make a comparison today that America has many idols. Our idols aren't always on the shelf. Some are, but we have many idols just like the Corinthians. And I would say to you that Islam is another religion. It's not the same religion as the Christian faith at all. And we need to know what it believes and what we believe. So while uh, Aphrodite was kind of the, the, the biggest religion there in Corinth and Poseidon was second and then the worship of Caesar was third, it's important to say that we also have a pantheon of gods that we struggle with in America. So let me give you a little comparison. The ancient Egyptians worshiped the gods of fields and rivers and light and darkness, like Anubis and Horus and Osiris and Newt and Ra. They worship the gods of nature. Let me ask you a question. Do people worship nature today? I've heard Pastor Tony Evans ask this question many times. Too many people are more worried about Mother Nature than they are worried about Father God. I think we might have an idol problem there. In ancient Canaan, the Israelites 
would, uh, as they were entering this, this nation, were having to deal with an idolatry there of worship to a statue called Molech. Now, Molech called on the Canaanites to offer their children to be burned alive to him. They would actually place infants in his fire chamber, in his outstretched arms to be burned alive. So let me ask you this question. Do people today sacrifice their children on the altar of convenience? Um, I'm not even going to get into abortion and things like that, but just in everyday life, do we often, on the altar of convenience, sacrifice our children? In the ancient days of Israel, there was a worship of materialism. Baal was the god of weather and financial success, and Ashtaroth was the, the goddess of sex and romance. And today, we worship professional athletes and movie stars and fashion models and recording artists. And we are tempted to worship the same kind of gods without the old-fashioned names and images. Ancient Corinth and other cities like Greece and Rome had the pantheon of gods. In America, we have pluralism, which is our pantheon. In fact, there are more than 600,000 non-Christian religions in the world today. You think about Hinduism and its system of reincarnation and Brahma and Islam and, uh, I believe, the, the moon god Allah and uh, witchcraft, whether it's white or dark witchcraft, or the horoscopes and tarot cards and, and Ouija boards. And so Paul is writing a church in the midst of this mess, just like we are in the midst of this mess. And the question is, how do we relate to all of these other religions and this other kind of worship? Paul says, if you notice in verse three, if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. So I think the point here is the Corinthians should be less concerned about what they know and more concerned about who knows them. Who is our God? That's what I want to answer today. Who is our God that we get hope from? Many of the, these people had roots in paganism. Many of the Corinthians had worshipped pagan gods in the past. And so it's very important for them to know what they are supposed to do in their, their current lives to relate to paganism and idolatry. So Psalm 135 makes something really clear, something that Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8. He says, we know that an idol is nothing in the world. It has no real existence. Because there is only one true God, idols are not competing gods. That's the same thing the psalmist said. He says, the idols of the nations are silver and gold and the work of human hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak, and eyes, but they do not see, and ears, but they do not hear, nor is there any breath in their mouths. And those who make them become like them, and so do all who trust in them. So here's the thing. The reality is what you worship will determine how you act. That's what verse 18 says. Those who made them became like them. So the kind of God you worship will determine how you act. Now, Paul in verse 4 says very clearly in 1 Corinthians 8, there is no God but one. When he makes this statement, he is making the confession of the people of God throughout the history of the world. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, we find what the Jews call the Shema, the ancient prayer of the Jewish people. Now, in Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5, the reason why this prayer is called the Shema is because the first word in Hebrew is here. That's the Hebrew word Shema. Moses says, hear Israel, Yahweh our Elohim, Yahweh is one, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. I think Paul, as a former Jewish rabbi and a great teacher of the Old Testament, is actually quoting this in 1 Corinthians 8. And this was a prayer that Jews would pray twice a day, every morning and evening in Jesus' time. And Paul is saying there's only one God, the creator of the world. All these other idols, all these other religions are human inventions at best. And at worst, they are demonic in nature. They are dark and they are leading people into evil and brokenness and, and really leading people to hell. So the point here is the pagan pantheon, everything I've introduced to you today is not irrelevant. You can't retreat from paganism. It must be confronted. We cannot be neutral to the religions of this world. You cannot assimilate. We can't all just sing kubaya and get along. We must know what we believe. We must know what they believe. We must know there is only one God, and we must know how we are to live because of this. So in, in verse 5, he says, yeah, there are so-called gods. 
whether in the heaven, people worship the sun, the moon, the stars. In that day, it was Jupiter and Juno and Mercury. Or in earth, the gods like uh, the god Poseidon, the god of the seas in Corinth. But he says, there is no other god but one. These are not real gods in verse 5. And then in verse 6, uh, he makes something very clear here. But to us, us Christians, we acknowledge there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things. Now, you'll notice how I laid out verse 6 for you on the screen. 1 Corinthians 8, 6, I believe, was a type of a creedal statement or a confessional formula of the early church. And so I think it's very possible that Paul is saying something that the early church would often confess, like we do often the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed. He takes Deuteronomy 6, and he's going to expand it here to help us understand there's only one true God. There's one God, the Father. The point here is he is Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament. Brahma and Allah are not at all God. Only one God exists who is Father of all, the author of all things. Only Christianity has a father as God. The other gods of the world are very stoic. They are cold. They are absent. Our God reveals himself as father to us. Our God is the father of whom are all things. Now, the gods of the ancient world were gods that only ruled part of the earth. They might have ruled the stars or the sea or or the land or the, the crops. Our God is Father over all. He cares about you today. He cares about your welfare. He cares about what you're going through. He cares about the suffering in America. He cares about what your family is facing. And notice Paul says, of whom are all things. He is the fountain and the source of everything that exists. This is a beautiful statement. Of him are all things. What does this mean exactly? It means space, time, and matter all come from God. He stands outside of these things. He is uncreated and unoriginated. How do we find this concept of God? The the Bible begins this way. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, that's time. God created the heavens, that's space, and the earth, that's matter. So our God is not limited by time. He is not limited by location. He stands outside of these things. He's above and beyond them. All things come from him. And we as Christians are for him. We owe our existence to him. We've been saved by him, changed by him, created by him. But what's amazing is what comes next in 1 Corinthians 8. This is so shocking. Just as God is Father, and from whom are all things, and we to him, So the Lord is Jesus, the Messiah, through whom are all things and we through him. There can be no mistake here, friends. Paul has placed Jesus right into Deuteronomy chapter 6. He is telling us that Israel's God, the Messiah, is Jesus Christ. The Yahweh, the Lord of the Old Testament, is Jesus Christ. Yes, there's two different persons here, but there is one God. This is parallelism here. Jesus is God of God, light of light, true God of true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through whom all things were made. The only real God is the God of Scripture revealed in Jesus Christ. He is the Lord. We owe our allegiance to no one else but Jesus Christ alone as King. He is the only Lord to be worshipped and bowed down to. And notice, just as all things come from the Father, all things come through Jesus Christ. They are by him. Again, he is also the fountain and the author of them. This is what the Bible teaches. John 1, 3, all things were made through him, through Jesus. Nothing was made without him. Colossians 1, it's very broken down explicitly in detail. All things were created by him, heaven and earth, visible, invisible, all things. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So this is an explicit statement that not only did Jesus create everything, he is the one true God. Through him, we live. He has created us and redeemed us, and we have our life and being through him. No matter how hard things get, he is with us. He will not fail us. 
Calvin has said here is we have our beginning from him, so we ought to devote our life to him as its end. Everything is from him, for him, and to him. That's what the great doxology of Romans 11 says, and Hebrews even says he upholds the whole universe by the word of his power. I don't know what you're going through today, how hard things have been for you, but I know this, God is in control. He's not going to fail us, church family. Jesus is the one true God. We are not uh, worshiping a phantom. We are not delusional in our faith. There is a creator of all who stands outside of time, space, and matter and is in control of the most finite detail of your life today. He's not done with us. He loves us. So again, why would I now talk about the God of Islam in our last few moments? Well, Islam is a growing religion. It's a religion that's in our community of Escambia County. There's a couple mosques in our community now. I read in the Pensacola News Journal that some of the Afghani refugees will very possibly be coming to Pensacola, Florida, and they were asking for donations through a local charity. So there's probably going to be an increase in Islamic population in our community. We as Christians need to learn more about Muslims to be able to share our faith more effectively, pray more strategically, and demonstrate the love of Jesus to Muslims in our community. But let's be clear, there's only one God. We're not learning about Islam today to say Islam is a, another faith like Christianity. The, the God of Islam is not the God of the Bible. We want to make that very clear. So let's do a quick run through about Islam and compare Islam to what we've seen about the Lord Jesus Christ. So first off, let's talk about when Islam shows up in the world. You'll notice that on the timeline of world religions, Judaism which is actually the giving of the law to Moses and the Ten Commandments, is around the year 1400, the Exodus, 1446 to be specific. And of course, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are way back farther than that, Noah, Adam, and Eve, the creation of the world. And then when you go to uh, Christianity, we say it's around the year AD 30, AD 33, somewhere in there. Islam doesn't show up on the scene until 622 AD, 600 years after Jesus died and rose again from the grave. Now, we know as Christians, our faith is an eternal faith. Ephesians 1 says, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Before Genesis 1-1, God had a plan and knew you, and he was at work to elect and change lives and save us forever. But first off, context. Islam begins with Muhammad around the year 622 BC. Secondly, where do we find Islam at? Well, you'll notice on the screen that um, the number one country is, according to back in the year 2015, was Indonesia with 215 million Muslims. But then you're going to notice right outside Afghanistan, the two neighboring na nations to the east, India and Pakistan, have the next highest populations, 194 million and 184 million Muslims. That's pretty amazing to see that. Now, I gave you the statistics up at the top you'll see that there's 2.5 billion professing Christians. That includes Roman Catholics, uh, Orthodox, Protestants, Lutherans, etc. And there's 1.8 billion Muslims in the world. So that gives you an idea. Islam is the second largest religion in the world by far. And it is a fast-growing religion, to say the, the least. What this means is that one-fifth of the world's population are currently Muslim. And while most live in Asia and North Africa in the Middle East, they are growing in the Soviet Union and China, the former countries of the Soviet Union uh, in Asia, and then in China, and then even in North America and South America and Europe. Uh, this is an important religion in the world that we need to, to understand. Even in the U.S., the number of Muslims continues to increase. Right now, there's somewhere between 3.5 and more million Muslims. This is a four-year-old study. I, know, I could not find a more recent one, but it's believed by 2040, Muslims will be the second largest religious group in America within the next 19 years. So we have neighbors that are Muslims in our community. We need to know how to love them and what they believe and what they believe about their God in the Lord Jesus Christ in particular. So understand Islam and the different branches of Islam with me. There are three major groups in America when it comes to Islam. First off, you have Sunni Islam, which is 
89% in the USA and 90% of Muslims in the world. Sunnis and the Shias, the two largest groups, both come directly from Muhammad. Now there's, there's different smaller subsections under these groups, different sects, if you will, but Sunnis are the largest by far. 1.6 billion of Muslims in the world are Sunni. Then you look at Shia Islam, 11% of Muslims in the USA are committed to Shiite Islam, and 10% in the world, about 200 million, are so. When you think about some of these radical groups like Islamic State and Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, they're all Sunni Islam. So ISIS is Sunni, Al-Qaeda is Sunni of the Wahhabist branch of Islam, and then the Taliban is Sunni from a very small sect, the Deobandi branch of Islam. So the deal is when Muhammad died, he did not appoint a successor. And so Islam split between Sunni and Shiites. And then, of course, in America, we have the Nation of Islam, which started in 1930 under Elijah Muhammad and later uh, was picked up by Louis Farrakhan and still exists today, though there's only about 50,000 members of the Nation of Islam. So basically, Islam split after Muhammad died because he didn't appoint a successor. And Sunnis believed that um, the new leader of Islam should be elected. The caliph should be elected as the leader of the Islamic nation. And the word Sunni is an Arabic word that means one who follows the traditions of the prophet. On the other hand, Shia Muslims believe that leadership should have stayed in the prophet's own family or those appointed by him. And the word Shia in Arabic means a group or supportive party of people. And so while these two groups agree on the core fundamentals of Islam, and they recognize one another as Muslims, there is tension there even between these two. Now, if you look on this map, you'll get an idea that uh, the, the dark green is the Shia Muslims. You notice mainly in Azerbaijan and Iran, and then the rest of the green is where the majority of world Muslims are located. So let's talk about Islamic authority. Why do Muslims believe what they believe? Well, their authority comes from a book called the Quran. Muslims believe that Muhammad received his words from God through the angel Gabriel directly. And the word Quran comes from a root Arabic word, Qara'a, which means to read or recite. Now, Muhammad was illiterate, but uh, he said that he memorized all the words that Gabriel gave him, and then he dictated them down to scribes who cross-checked them through his lifetime. So to quote one Muslim work, the Quran is the holy book of Islam sent by God through the prophet Muhammad. It is the exact word of God, and in itself it claims that if the prophet changed one word, his neck would have been severed. So this is the holy book of Islam. Now, what's interesting is that it does have a lot of biblical allusions and stories in it, but they have been amended to, uh, to, to follow Islamic belief. For instance, Abraham doesn't take Isaac to be offered on Mount Moriah. He takes Ishmael to be offered on Mount Moriah. To understand the Quran, they don't have chapters. They have surahs. Each surah is a chapter, and there's 114 surahs in total in the Quran. And the Bible is about three times as long as the Quran. And most Muslims uh, only accept parts of the Gospels and the Law of Moses in the Bible. But even then, they believe there are many errors in the Bible. The second tradition in Islam is the Hadith. The Hadith is a book that carries a lot of weight for Muslims. It's supposed to be a transmission of what the Prophet said about his life history, what Muhammad spoke and gives examples of daily living for Muslims. And then lastly is the Sunnah, which is the where Sharia law comes from. This is the Islamic legal code, the jurisprudence. And it gives events from the life of Muhammad and offers examples for living and ethics for Muslims. The word Islam itself means submission or submission to God. So the question is, is Allah of Islam that Muhammad talked about, is he the same God as 1 Corinthians 8, the Yahweh of the Old Testament? What is the relation of, of Islam to the Jesus Christ of Scripture? What do the Quran, what does the Quran say about Jesus? Do we have the same God? Well, friends, I believe wholeheartedly the answer to that is no. 
So understand, if you talk to a Muslim, they will talk about Jesus. They call him Isa. He is one of the most respected uh, prophets of Islam. There are 124,000 prophets in Islam's history, according to the Quran, and Jesus is one of them. And he is the most respected outside, of course, of Muhammad. He was sinless. He was born of a virgin. He was a miracle worker. All these things Muslims say about Jesus, very interesting. Oh, maybe, maybe they are the same. Well, they're not. Because in Islam, Jesus is not the son of God. His virgin birth was kind of like Adam's creation. It was not a virgin birth like we believe it. Jesus was not crucified on the cross, died and resurrected. Muslims believe that Jesus will return to earth right before judgment day, and he will turn Christians to Islam. And he is mentioned 25 times in the Quran. Now, the amazing thing is many Muslims believe more about Jesus than a lot of liberal Christians do. That, that's pretty staggering to think about. However, they don't believe enough. And what they do believe is so twisted and so wrong. It's another religion. It's another faith and another God. I want to quote to you one well-known Islamic writer and apologist, Shabir Ali. He says, the Quran tells us many wonderful things about Jesus, or Isa in Arabic. As a result, believers in the Quran love Jesus, honor him, and believe in him. In fact, no Muslim can be a Muslim unless he or she believes in Jesus on whom be peace. That sounds really good, but we got to keep going. Christians and Muslims both believe in Jesus. They are, however, divided over the question of his divinity. Fortunately, this difference can be resolved if we refer the question to both the Bible and the Quran, because both the Bible and the Quran teach that Jesus is not God. Full stop right there. Jesus is not God. I'm going to show you this from the Quran very briefly and then get back to the scriptures as we close this message. So first off, chapter 930, uh, Surah 930 from the Quran. I want you to see from the Quran itself that the God of Islam is not the God of the Bible. He, Allah is like one of the gods 1 Corinthians talks about. He is a so-called God, not a real God, and a rejection of the saving work of Jesus Christ. Surah 930, the Jews say Ezra is the son of Allah, and Christians say the Messiah, the Christ, is the son of Allah. That is their statement from their mouths, Muhammad says. They imitate the saying of those who disbelieve before them. Listen to this. May Allah destroy them. How are they deluded? Very clearly, Islam does not believe in Jesus Christ like we believe in Jesus. They hate the idea that he could be the son of God. They reject his divinity as God of God, true God of true God. Friends, even on the, the, at the Temple Mount in Israel, in the Dome of the Rock, it says, right, inscribed on the Dome of the Rock, there is no God but Allah. Allah has no son. In fact, uh, you know, one of the, the, the creed, the Shahada, of Islam says there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. They reject Jesus Christ in total. It's important to know a little bit about church history. There was a great church father named John of Damascus, known as John St. John Damascene, who dates right after Muhammad. If Muhammad wrote the Quran or if Muhammad uh, had the Quran dictated to him in 622, John of Damascene is dated 675 to 749. You'll hear his name there, Damascus, Syria. He's right in the heart of, of Islamic world, where the Islamic religion begins to spread. He wrote a book called Concerning Heresy. And he speaks of all the heresies that had developed in the Christian church up to his point, uh, 600 years after Jesus. And then the last heresy he talks about is the heresy of the Ishmaelites, or those who follow Muhammad, in which he confronts Muhammad and he calls him a false prophet. And he says that this, this, this uh, heresy is the greatest of all the heresies. It, it finds its origins in the past, maybe like in the Arian heresies, where people had denied that Jesus was God, or that Jesus was eternal, that the Holy Spirit is God. And um, he says that Muhammad was a forerunner of the Antichrist in his writings. You see here that he says that this man, he must have chanced upon the Old and New Testaments and he talked with a heretic of the Aryan variety, and then he brought his own heresy into the world. So Islam is not Christianity at all. This is what John of Damascus wrote. He said, Muhammad says that the Jews wanted to crucify Jesus in violation of the law, and that they seized his shadow. 
a phantom of Jesus and crucified this. But notice, Islam says the Messiah himself was not crucified. Muhammad says, nor did he die. For God, out of his love, took him to himself into heaven. He pulled him off of the cross. Muhammad says this, that when Jesus had ascended into heaven, he asked him, O oh Jesus, did you say I am the Son of God and God? According to Muhammad, Jesus answered, Be merciful to me, Lord. You know that I did not say this and that I did not scorn to be your servant. Sinful men have written that I made this statement. They have lied about me and fallen into era, error. And God answered and said to him, I know that you did not say this word. So clearly, the early Christians knew this was not Christianity. This was heresy. This is another God. This is demonic. A, a demon revealed these words to Muhammad, not the angel Gabriel. This is not the truth of God. They deny everything our faith holds dear about Jesus. Jesus was not died. He did not rise again from the dead. He is not God in the Islamic religion. This is another so-called God, the God of Islam. Now, again, to quote the Quran. Chapter 4, 157, they say in boast, we killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. Notice the Quran says they killed Jesus not, nor crucified him. It was made to appear to them. And those who differ are full of doubts with no certain knowledge. Uh, for of a certainty, they did not kill Jesus. Muhammad believed that Jesus did not die, which means, brothers, if Jesus did not die and rise again, our faith is in vain and we are not saved. Totally different religion. In chapter 5, verse 17, it says, In blasphemy indeed are those who say that Allah is the Messiah, the Son of Mary. Say, who then has the least power against Allah if his will were to destroy Christ, the Son of Mary? It goes on. He creates, Allah creates what he pleases. Allah has power over all things. In other words, he created Jesus. Jesus is not eternal God. He is not the one who before Abraham was, I am. He is not eternal God. He is not the one who is from everlasting, like Micah 5 says, or Emmanuel, God with us, like Isaiah 7. He is not the one who, like Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. Not at all. Chapter 5, verse 72 of the Quran. They do blaspheme who say, Allah is Messiah, the son of Mary. But said Jesus, said Messiah, O children of Israel, worship Allah, my Lord, and your God. In the Quran, Jesus was an Allah worshiper, not a Yahweh worshiper, not the God of Israel and the Messiah of Israel. So very clearly, this is the Quran's posture towards the Lord Jesus Christ. What a sad thing it is indeed. We do not have the same faith. But let's stop for a minute and compare this to the Bible. The Bible is clear. The phrase son of God in reference to Jesus is used 49 times in the New Testament. Think about the great confession that is made by Peter to the Lord Jesus in Matthew 16. Peter said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. God revealed this truth to him. Friends, it is so clear in the Bible that Jesus is God. There is only one God. He's not Allah. He is Yahweh, the God of the Bible. All things are from him, and we are made for him. And there is one Lord. Remember, that word Lord is synonymous with Yahweh in the Bible. There is one Lord, Jesus Christ. Just like the Father of him are all things and through whom we live. Jesus is God, and he can, do, he can change your life today. He can change the most hardened sinner today. He can help you no matter how weak you are today because he's God. That is not the God of Islam. It's very sad at the end of, of Muhammad's life in Hadith, volume 5, number 266, Muhammad said these words. He said, by Allah, even though I am the apostle of Allah, yet I do not know what Allah will do with me. Muhammad didn't even know what would happen to him when he died, if he would go to heaven and be with Allah. He had no assurance of his salvation because he had no savior who died on the cross for him. He had no uh, mediator for his sins. He had no one who could take away his shame and sin and guilt. And so he said in the Hadith that, I don't know what Allah is going to do with me. But the Bible says in John 3, whoever believes in the son has eternal life. 
And whoever does not obey will not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. The Bible says these things are written that you would know that you have eternal life if you look to Jesus Christ. So, friends, that's what Islam teaches. It's another God. It's not the Jesus of the Bible. We need to pray for our Muslim neighbors. We need to love them. We need to share the gospel with them. We need to pray for Christians in Afghanistan. But we also need to have our faith strengthened this morning, brothers and sisters. We serve a living Christ, a God who will not fail us. Jesus is 100% truly God, God of God, light of light, true God of true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. He didn't just die for you and rise again. He's ruling and reigning today. He will not fail you. This is God's holy word. Oh, that we would look to him. I would love to take time right now and spend some time in prayer together as a church. I think it's important that right now we are a praying people, that we are praying for one another. Many uh, in our church are doing really well. They've recovered from COVID. There's a few new cases you heard. We need to pray for our brother, Frank Butler, and for his wife, sister, Julia and their family. We need to pray for our brother Stephen this morning. Um, he is in ICU. Oh, that we would pray for him together right now and lift our hearts to him. We need to pray for Christians in Afghanistan and Iraq and around the world suffering persecution. We need to pray for our Muslim neighbors that they would come to Jesus Christ. We need to pray for this new week and pray for Escambia County. 2,500 infections last week, 2,000 the week before. Oh, God, we need to pray for his mercy together. So will you join me and let's pray together, then we'll close with the Lord's benediction. Our God and our King, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. Thank you, Jesus. You are the one true God, and you will not fail us. So, Lord, I pray now, pray for everyone that is still sick or battling COVID, Lord, that we would remember you are God. You walked on the waters. You turned the water into wine. You stilled the storm. Christ Jesus, you entered this world as a virgin. You died for everything wrong with us, and you rose again to make us perfectly right with you. Jesus, you are on the throne ruling and reigning now. Please work and intervene in the lives of those who are hurting. May we look to you, Jesus, as God, and may our faith not fail, but be strengthened this morning, O oh God. I pray today especially for our brother Stephen and sister Karen Ule. Lord, be with them. May they know your love. Lord, we plead for your mercy for these treatments to help our brother. May he know your encouragement and your strength this morning, oh God. Pray for healing and mercy. Pray for our elder brother, Frank, sister Julia. Please be with them and watch over them. For many others that we all have, God, hear our prayers right now. Pray right now for those you love and care about. Lord, we pray for the church in Afghanistan and Iraq and other places around the world suffering persecution. Be merciful, God. Help us to have a spirit of praying without ceasing for them. Pray for our community. Help Sacred Heart, Ascension, and Baptist Hospital and West Florida Hospital. Help all of the healthcare providers. Give them strength and protection and wisdom. Nurses and doctors, Lord, we pray for your mercy over our community. We love you, God. Jesus, you're Lord. So that's why we can call out to you on this your day. We pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. I want to remind you that uh, if you need prayer, you can go to our website, lovepensacola.org slash need prayer. And I encourage you to uh, let us know how we can pray for you, or you can contact me directly. If we can do anything to serve you at all. We want to be there for you. Watch your email, watch Facebook about announcements about this week. I have a, a really strong feeling we will not have Wednesday night in person again uh, because of the numbers and because of what's going on, but that'll be confirmed to you by Tuesday for sure. So please watch your email. I don't even want to speak about it now because I really don't know. A reminder that you can give online and worship the Lord at lovepensacola.org slash online giving. Ministry is still going on to the best of our ability under these circumstances. Please worship the Lord and give back to him for he is faithful God. So here a benediction from God's word. To him who loved us 
and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And he has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To Jesus be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Love God, love your neighbor, be the church. We close our time together right now in Jesus' name. Amen. You are loved, and we'll see you soon, God willing.